Um, as we know, and as we heard earlier, the fight against climate change is contributing to an already fraught geopolitical landscape in a transitioning world that is destabilised by climate disruptions and geoeconomics competition. Um, our next keynote speaker, um, is, she's just back from the Arctic. Uh, she's a global expert on the geopolitics of energy and the risks of conflict and fragility associated with climate change. She's a fellow at the global think tank Carnegie Europe, and her research involves investigating how to support a move towards um, regenerative foreign and security policy within the European Union. Uh, she is no uh, stranger to Accelerate. She was with us two years ago and she blew us away then. Uh, but Olivia Lazard, her address was so fantastic two years ago, we delighted. We asked her just to come back and speak to us. She will be joining us uh, virtually once again. But um, our, our last um, address before we, we go to lunch, why don't we just hand over to Zoom in the screen and to Olivia Lazard. <clears throat> thank you so much. I'm really glad to be back. And thank you to the IIEA and ESB for inviting me. I'm sorry that I can't be with you in person today. Um, I am indeed back from the Arctic and in between different travels, but I really wanted to intervene in this, um, in this conference to try and give a wider sense of what is currently happening, because I think that with the discussions about the energy transition, the geopolitical disruptions at play, we fail to see how different things connect. And through research that I and other researchers have been doing, um, we've realized essentially that there may be a need to try and come up with a new type of paradigm, an explanation or a narrative to try and sort of connect the dots between various aspects of what's rocking the world at the moment um, and how to make sense of what's ahead in the future. For now, we've called this paradigm the Anthropolitik, which stands, stands short essentially for the return of Realpolitik within um, the Anthropocene. And in order to explain what is what we're up against, we actually need to start from the planetary security purview with a few data points that are permeating our world at the moment. Some of you may already know it, but in 2023, we already passed the 1.5 threshold for a few days. The 1.5 um, uh, Celsius temperature threshold for a few days. This was only momentary. And scientists have essentially told us that this was going to happen, especially with the return of El Nino last year, which tends to essentially sort of um, magnify temperature rises and spikes in our global system. Scientists also tell us that it is very likely that we will act actually cross the 1.5 degree threshold permanently already by 2026 or 2027. Other scientists a bit more on the fringe at the moment or let's say in the sort of margins of climate science discussions such as James Hansen tell us that not only are we racing past the 1.5 degree threshold, we're actually accelerating towards an exponential rate of global warming, and that we may reach the two degree threshold by the end of next decade, not by the middle of the century. This tells us essentially that we're essentially moving into an era of climate insecurity, which is now part and parcel of our system at a structural level, at a systemic level. The other thing that scientists tell us is that we have a biophysical limit that is reached at 1.5 degree thresholds. Ecosystems have a very high ecological sensitivity to temperature changes across the globe. We know it, we're starting to observe it. And this has repercussions, particularly regarding the tipping point theory which essentially explains that there are ecological interdependencies between the poles, the AMOC system and the oceans, the Amazon system, and a number of other key keystone ecological and ecosystems um, that essentially sustain the ecological balance of our world. And we're already seeing with a number of signals within our global system that tipping points may actually be accelerating, that they may be showing signs of tipping indeed. This is a chart showing you 
um, the level, the decrease in sea ex in um, Antarctic um, sea ice extent in the Antar in the Antarctic in the global south. Um, it shows you essentially with this red line that we're reaching a moment of criticality where we're losing much more ice and um, and we're thawing at a much wider pace than was originally expected in the models. And the last thing that we know is obviously that we have also not just global climate forcings in the form of temperature change, which impact ecosystems. We're also impacting ecosystems by anthropogenic activities, such as industrialization, urbanization, and construction of infrastructures in different places around the world, which contribute essentially to the ecological fragmentation of our world, which has a number of different repercussions. Some have to do with pollution, some have to do with even more water scarcity and water scarcification, which obviously has a much wider, much more structural effect on the global resource base. This is a graph which the Stockholm Resilience Institute um, has worked on. It shows essentially that we have approximately nine planetary boundaries that have um, that hold our world into balance. And the latest research has shown essentially that six out of nine planetary boundaries are already in complete overshoot. So we have climate forcings coming from above, if we may call it this way, and then anthropogenic activities, which are essentially exercising pressures on the natural resource base from a global perspective from below as well, thanks to the activities of complex human civilizations. When we hear about these data points, we tend to have a very direct and logical consequential um, conclusion, which is let's accelerate towards the energy transition. We're already very late. And this is absolutely true. In spite of efforts in the direction of the renewables transition, we're still over 80% dependent on fossil fuels today. So we know, obviously, that our trajectory is not safe. But in order to accelerate, much like you know, what the conference calls for, we also need to understand the biophysical and ensuring geopolitical environment that these data points create and adjust our policies, our private sector behaviors, our democratic debates, and our de-risking plans regarding how to handle the climate-related transitions themselves the risks that they actually create, because they create a number of security risks from a planetary and international security um, risk perspective, and how to handle also and to prevent the derailment risks. And this is what this presentation is mostly about. It is about trying to shape, trying to make sense essentially of the global environment that is ours today, but which we barely talk about um, in, uh, on average. Climate change and anthropogenic activity are going to give us three incredible, momentous and interdependent sets of challenges, which we're barely talking about from an economic, political and geopolitical perspective at the moment. The first thing is that obviously we're going to have to face more and more climate shocks and climate hazards. They will be in some circumstances obviously nationally determined. We see them happening right this moment in China, in Dubai, in the UAE, in places like Oman, in the US, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Some countries will obviously have a better chance at adapting than others, but globally there is no real discussion yet on what good adaptation looks like. For now, it's focused on infrastructure as opposed to profound transformations on territorial zones of habitations and productive capacities. And I'll tie on this in a second. There is also, we're starting to have conversations about how climate change is impacting the global economy, but barely so. What we know so far from the current estimates, which are likely to be underestimates, is that we're already losing $16 million an hour on account of climate hazards. These 
do not, these figures do not integrate yet all of the knock-on and secondary effects of climate change, which are themselves also related to scarcity and to the shocks that a number of supply chains are likely to experience more and more in the short to medium term future. What we know about scarcity is that already by 2030, we can expect to have on average 40% less fresh water on a global level. This is a magnitude of scarcity that we're not prepared for. Fresh water is growing scarcer as a result, again, of the climate forcing, the rise in temperatures from a global perspective, which provoke more evapotranspiration. But we're also actually accelerating the scarcification of water on account of the various economic activities that are simply not accounting for water consumption and for water use. What that will have in terms of trickle effects is obviously that we will face a world where soils become less fertile, especially in certain areas that are warming faster than global average, including in Europe. But it's not just agriculture, which is obviously concerned. It's also industrial capacities. The moment you start running out of water and where you have less predictability over your water resources, you start having more difficulty in terms of your industrial and technological resource base. A place like Taiwan, for example, saw it about a couple of years ago where drought nearly brought the production and manufacturing of semiconductors to a halt, at least for a temporary measure. Fortunately for Taiwan, the moment when it was about to go red in terms of national emergency, it rained. And so it stopped essentially the or stalled the national emergency in terms of drought. There are also challenges with energy capacity related to water scarcity and drought. We're seeing it in places like the Gulf, like Iraq, where or in Egypt, where you have, you know, in some circumstances, energy capacity coming to a halt for a few days as a result of various climate related hazards, which come from a hydrological base related also to dust storms. And of course, and I will sort of, you know, talk about this in a minute, the challenges related to water are particularly acute at the moment when you're trying to change your energy base. And when you're trying to shift your energy base from a fossil base to a mineral base, mining is extremely water intensive. It also, for entire mineral supply chains, we need vast quantities of water in order to support the various types of industrial activities that go into mining, into processing, technological assembly, and afterwards deployment of clean tech. This is one of the reasons why I want to talk or raise you know, the issue of water today, because water is actually going to represent one of the massive derailment risks for the energy transition itself. We barely talk about it. We tend to talk about it mostly in terms of regulation, finance, and you know, various types of you know, geopolitical issues that I will talk about in a minute. But we have to have this longer view over what actually enables a fundamentally needed energy and economic transformation. Then the last thing that we're really not talking about at all in international relations, which will ensue as a result of climate disruptions, climate insecurity, and anthropogenic activities, is the movement of species and the movement of ecosystems. And the gradual change, essentially, in the way in which climate niches in the form of habitable, livable, and productive spaces will actually start being geographically redistributed. We're already seeing at the moment, especially last year, when there were indeed a number of hikes and record-breaking um, issues, um, or sort of, you know, records rather, um, around sort of the global climate, we're already seeing massive fish populations move from the equators up north, particularly around northern European waters and Nordic waters. 
We're already seeing the movement of bird populations. Typically, you know, anecdotal events, you know, such as the movement of ibis populations from Egypt to the Venice, Venice, Venice Lagoon every year is growing. All of these things are essentially signals of an Earth system which is gradually changing in its composition and where the climate niches which enable the life, the livelihoods, complex human civilizations are also moving, quite simply, because the natural resource base of different biomes and ecosystems are moving and gradually shifting in terms of, the, of their geographical um, you know, distribution. What that will mean in terms of the short term is that shocks and scarcity will have implications in the form of supply chain disruptions, trade disruptions, and something quite important as well, inflation is slowly likely to become more structural and will have destabilizing effects. In countries where the social contract is brittle and where you have large population seg you know, segments relying on staple subsidies, there may well be swells of political demonstrations against governments and what is considered elites or sort of better economically endowed segments of the population. In countries or in regions like in Europe, the gradually diminishing purchasing power related to inflation and to shocks and the ability to make ends meet or to also sort of graduate through different stages of life will likely embolden radical parties on the right and on the left. This creates an, econ an economic environment in which investments are more difficult for climate mitigation policies, as well as for climate adaptation policies. Technically, we would currently need more investments into responsible mining, into public transportation, into social public goods such as health and education, which represent the backbone of a productive and cohesive nation but we're likely to see more economic contraction as a result of the shocks and the gradual sort of changes in the ecological base of economics, which will create more and more pressures on the ability to actually invest in the right places as opposed to respond to crises. This is already something that we're seeing in Europe. But there is also something which we have to start talking about today, which is something that is scary enough, but which requires indeed a lot more attention towards how to avoid the worst case scenarios in terms of where we're headed. The movement of ecosystems and species and the gradual redistribution of the natural resource base from a global perspective are starting to have implications that will manifest more clearly in the medium and long term. They're quite severe. We need to talk about them. And this is the, the reason why, you know, like we are, um, you know, we need to talk about them is because we're, we are actually accelerating into an age of climate regime change much faster than expected. We are entering an age of climate niche geopolitics. Certain regions will gradually become uninhabitable either for parts of the year or more permanently because of temperature rise and or scarcity of key resources such as water and food. Other regions, by comparison, will relatively benefit due to changes in rainfall patterns, biomovement and fertility of soils. I insist on the term relative. No nation in the world will escape the structural instability and shocks that climate change will bring into the global economic system. But typically in a region like Europe, which is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world, and which is still actively engaging in resource intensive anthropogenic activities, the availability of water and fertile soils will face growing risks. This means that Europe will lose macroeconomic capacity and microeconomic resilience, especially in the absence of robust and ecology-based adaptation plans. We're already seeing some of this unfolding now in the Iberian Peninsula, in Southern France, in Italy, and in Greece. The rest of Europe will gradually start becoming more ecologically brittle, 
unless we preempt the type of ecological fragmentation that I'm talking about. And by contrast, a country like Russia will relatively benefit from climate change. Russia is the biggest country in the world. It already possesses one fifth of the world's water resources. It is also one of the world's largest bread baskets for wheat, sunflower oil, and other types of commodities, which are essential for the world's global economic system as it is designed today. This water and fertile soil endowment is set to increase with climate change. Russia will have more water in terms of quantity and spatial distribution. This means that it will give Russia a comparative advantage in terms of agricultural production, industrial production, potentially in the future, technological production. And depending on how we deal with water in the next five years, it may also give Russia a comparative advantage on markets that may see a commodification of water resources. And if we want to imagine what Russian behavior related to how they use food and water as commodities may look like, we only need to look back at how Russia acted with Ukrainian grain deals. They hijacked grain, held it away from world markets, leading to gross inflation from a global perspective, and to fragility in countries that rely on grain imports for their stability. They massively invested simultaneously into disinformation campaigns into the same countries that experienced high fragility with a narrative blaming sanctions and therefore the West for hijacking the grain, you know, sort of stocks. Then when the grain deal was struck, over 70% of grain went to China, not fragile countries. This means that the international solidarity system when it comes to food security is, an, is coming under great untenable pressure against a background of increasing climate and conflict fragility in many parts of the world. With the Green Deal, what we saw are the premises of a geopoliticized world where power and real politic play over foundational resources and over the future of climate niches, which again are about habitable, productive, and relatively stable living spaces. The message here, or at least one of them, is that if we fail to act comprehensively on the climate and ecological crisis quickly, which we're not doing, we will quickly head into a zero sum game over climate niches, which will redefine borders because of the relationship between natural resources and productive capacities, which are at the heart of the social contract, even though we tend to underestimate the um, necessity essentially or the role of natural resources into enabling productive capacities and therefore stability as well as national cohesion. Actors such as the Kremlin have perfectly understood this when we in Europe have not. And contrary to how we view Russia, a state that pays no attention to climate change or you know, a state that has or that wants to be an imperialistic power that aims further than it could ever reach, the Kremlin has actually started gearing up its fundamental policies on agriculture, industry, and energy around the new reality that climate and ecological change are bringing. It understands that time plays in its favor and against that of states that care little for their resource base. This is important because obviously it's sort of sets a decor which is much more pervasive in geopolitics today than we tend to give it credit for. And it starts explaining the behavior of certain actors that have technically a longer term view regarding how they view politics. And this is an important decor or climate and ecological background to understand if we want to understand also the wider sort of geopolitics at play today, which we hear of and discuss, mostly focusing on chips, semiconductors, EVs, military equipment, and more largely, the means and shapes and content of what we call the fourth industrial revolution.
we are headed into an industrial revolution that is going to be extremely energy, material, and spatially extensive and intensive. And we are headed into this industrial revolution against the background of a planet in ecological and climate overshoot. This means that essentially we are collectively involved in a race to build a decarbonized, digitalized, and technological dependent economy on a planet or within a planet that technically has very little capacity to support the construction of new architectures for material and energy intensive infrastructures. But since we are already involved into this fourth industrial revolution, we need to understand how it plays out over these materials. And technically, what we know by now is that countries around the world compete broadly over three major things. The first thing is that we compete over the means to, be, to, build, to build and power the physical infrastructure of the fourth industrial revolutions. We compete over energy in its various forms, let it be for fossils, for nuclear, for critical raw materials, and for LNGs and other types of resources. We also compete, but that is you know, much um, more under the radar, over the resources that I talked about before, the foundational resources, food and water. Then the second wider bubble or basket over which we compete are the technological innovations and market penetration of new technologies. How great superpowers are essentially shaping their technological model and how they export it to other countries is going to create the global sort of technological order and global power balance. And then of course, we compete over the norms and values that underpin tech and the relationships it creates between states and citizens and between global powers as well as middle powers. These three things, much like previous industrial revolutions, will define the next era of power relations and norms that enshrine, embolden, and regulate power. And we know, obviously, and I talked about it two years ago, that the competition over critical raw materials is extremely important. It's important not, because, not just because of what we're seeing today, but because of the longer term effects it's going to have. They are, those critical raw materials, the very base of clean energy supply chains, digital equipment, and military equipment. That means that they are the basis for the infrastructure of energy, technological, and deterrence architectures of the, of the future. So of course, there's competition. And there is a competition that now spans the globe. This has you know, implications with current geopolitics, since now they're playing over an issue regarding over-dependency of the West and, frankly, the world on China as well as Russia. We know that China is well ahead on mining for critical raw materials, on processing of a number of minerals within supply chains, on tech innovations. We can only look at the way in which you know, China is rising to an overproduction capacity over electric vehicles, which is now being exported, including to regions like Europe. We are now seeing also how China is essentially sort of turning its vertical integration of mineral supply chains into an ability to create a new type of climate diplomacy where it turns to countries of the global south as a country of primary resort in terms of climate adaptation and climate mitigation. We also know by now, and I had talked about it two years ago, that Russia has prime resources for critical raw materials at home, for nickel, for tantalum, for rare earths, for lithium. We also know that they are engaged in diplomacy, which I would call rogue diplomacy, trying to gain access to deposits and reserves for critical raw materials, competing thereby with China, but mostly with the West, with European powers, with you know, the US. And within this rogue diplomacy, they use capture of political elites, territorialization via military um, means around you know, certain uh, reserve um, capacities. They also try to influence competition over critical raw materials with disinformation and misinformation, and they export a militarized model when it comes to how to cement relationships between certain global powers or middle-income powers with um, Russia by 
offering securitization services to wannabe authoritarian leaders. And that has implications in terms of how these leaders also relate to their own populations. There is gradually essentially a hollowing out of democracy happening on the back of the energy transition. And for Russia, this has a number of implications related to how to recover the Soviet capacity to be a prime actor within the critical raw material space. But more than that, it's essentially about trying to reestablish an ability to shape and to um, sort of influence the way in which global politics are playing out on the back of energy, not just for fossils, but also for critical raw materials and, um, as it so happens, also on nuclear um, uh, sort of, you know, supply chains. And now that the West has woken up to the extent of the competitive advantage of these two actors, we've entered officially the age of de-risking, de-risking of, glo of global supply chains away from Russia and China. That means, for one, diversification. Diversification means that we need to sort of reshore certain productive capacity for mineralization in, um, you know, countries which are energy and industrial um, super uh, powers such as the US, which has introduced the Inflation Reduction Act. And in Europe, we've introduced obviously the Repower EU, the Critical Raw Material Act, and a new type of diplomacy around raw materials. And whilst there is obviously a capacity for, the, for Europe and the US to come together, in spite of tensions related to trade wars and to um, technological competition, mostly what is happening is that there is a competition between the US, the EU, Russia, China, Saudi Arabia, India, and a number of other countries for resources which are mostly related or found in countries of the global south. I had already shown this um, map two years ago, but this is particularly important because of the wider context in which we're acting. The green dots show you the various types of critical minerals which are needed for the clean energy transition as well as the digital transition. You can see that there is a belt in between Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, the West Western Balkans and Central Asia. We know that Russia and China are currently ahead in trying to gain access to resources, reserves, and productive capacities in those countries. There is actually an instrumentalization of fragility um, in which you know characterizes a number of the country of countries in the global south within the global competition essentially for um, critical raw materials. So this has given way essentially to a raw materials diplomacy and a number of strategic partnerships within the EU particularly. These raw materials you know, partnerships and strategic partnerships are meant to try and shape the way in which additional mines will be constructed. We all know the numbers by the IEA. We know that we need much more additional mines than we currently have. Some talk in the dozen, dozens, some talk in the hundreds. But again, this is where the larger picture about how the natural resource base needs to be taken into account in order to understand also how geopolitics are now changing and shaping the way in which we are accelerating or decelerating over climate change. We know that a number of countries where you know, those reserves for minerals are located also happen to be climate vulnerable. This is the map at the bottom of the slide that you see here. A lot of the countries in red and in orange are particularly water stressed. They are particularly vulnerable to climate hazards and they're gradually more impacted by scarcity as well. This means, and I talked about it before, that this will impact essentially the ability to do mining in the future unless we actually understand the de-risking agenda as a de-risking agenda that includes ecology, that includes finance in these countries, that include economic resilience and adaptive capacities within those countries. We're still not talking about this, you know, very much at the moment. And one of the things that we're missing in this in this wider picture is that if we fail to take into account the ecological fragmentation that new ways of extractivism and new construction of big infrastructure heavy projects such as the Global Gateway or the Belt and Road Initiative or the Build Back Better you know, sort of agenda create, 
we will actually accelerate the rise of the anthropolitic in the sense that we will accelerate the movement of climate niches and the relative um, sort of, you know, power balance between those countries that are better endowed for from a natural resource perspective and those that are not. Because the more we actually deepen our um, sort of wider dependency on material and energy intensive economies, which is the case with the economies that we're trying to create with the fourth industrial revolution, the more we will actually weaken, fragment and, um, you know, bring into scarcity our natural resource base from a global perspective. And it's in those countries at the moment that this is playing out. And the final, you know, sort of map that I had shown also two years ago, which gives you a sense of how this particular conversation around de-risking is particularly important is because a lot of the countries where we have those resources are also endowed with critical ecosystems that we need to protect, regenerate and enshrine into you know like long-term protections in order to protect the global resource distribution of our world. This is not something that at the moment neither the EU nor the US are paying attention to. We are mostly talking about de-risking and diversification in response to short-term panic, very real and legitimate panic over the over-dependency on you know, geoeconomic supply chains towards Russia and China. But if we fail to bring those dependencies into the wider context, we fail to understand what security is going to mean in the future. And that brings me to end on Europe. Europe at the moment is at a disadvantage within the fourth industrial revolution and within anthropolitic and politics. We are talking mostly about open strategic, strategic autonomy and sovereignty. Our focus when we talk about this is on industry, defense, energy, but we tend to completely forget the natural resource base, the role of agriculture, the role of the nature restoration law, which was passed last year, but which was passed being completely weakened and hollowed out. We have to understand that the next commission, which is coming in within a few months, will be the very last commission within the European Union that will be able to create the type of transformative policies that will create essentially the resource base at home and abroad that will enable an acceleration of the energy transition, preempt the, de the derailment risks, and therefore preempt the longer term type of economic and um, sort of foundational resource dependencies that we're likely to actively walk into. This means that we need to adapt our Europe to fight the industrial, technological, and information fight, but we also need to equip Europe for an ecological regeneration agenda at home and abroad. Capacitating Europe towards adaptation in a world currently framed by geostrategy, where you see obviously that systems rivals such as China and Russia have developed the capacity to see on the longer term, not just on the industrial part, but on the ecological, agricultural and climate niche part that constitute essentially the way in which geopolitics are playing. Capacitating Europe means looking at how we do capital markets reforms, indeed, as was mentioned by the Draghi report or will be mentioned by the Draghi report, and how we allocate budget resources within the next multi-annual financial framework. An entire recalling is needed with a new analytical lens on what the stakes for collective security are today. And it starts actually with reforms on the common agricultural um, policy. Within the de-risking agenda, we need to realize, obviously, and I had said it before, but I will re-emphasize this message. The global south is currently at the heart of a global competition, which will define not just the industrial, economic, and technological balance of power of the future, but which will define the very space for existence, for safe, and just living of the human species. That means that the strategic partnerships that Europe is striking need to include much more than a diversification of economic resources for, for global South countries. It needs to include climate and nature finance, 
adaptation research and collaboration. It needs to include regeneration, including on sites of extraction, as well as debt relief, research and technology partnerships, and information fight or misinformation fight partnerships. This is a relationship now that the EU needs to try, strike with countries of the global south as a middle power facing and needing to relate to other middle powers to frame the fight for global adaptation, to preempt and prevent the slide into zero-sum geopolitics and anthropolitics. And it requires essentially Europe to fundamentally change the way in which it synergizes a number of its offers within the Commission, within the EES and the Council. We need a narrative today where every member state understands the stakes at play and the fact that indeed Europe, as Macron said yesterday, can die under all these foundational and dynamic pressures. Europe is a country that outsources its security and builds collective security via interdependencies. Those interdependencies are now coming under greater threat and greater fragmentation potential. Europe has a specific role in trying to make sure that we can rebuild those interdependencies for a world geared essentially for climate disruptions. And in this world, within this Europe, there are certain states that gel some of the most fundamental stakes that Europe deals with more than others. Ireland is actually one of them. Ireland is one of the bastions of defense for Europe and for global collective solidarity in a global context where foundational resources are coming under the combined pressures of scarcity and instrumentalization or weaponization. Its agricultural economy, its nature-based economy need to be invested with more means to transition towards a resilient, regenerative capacity and with an ability to show the way to other parts of Europe and from Europe to other parts of the world. And Ireland is not just a bastion within a global sort of geopolitical environment, which is using or sort of, you know, accelerating towards a breakdown of collective security through war, through weaponization of supply chains, and through norm subversion. It is also at the forefront. Ireland is also at the forefront of the fourth industrial revolution due to its relationship with tech giants. How Ireland creates, shapes conversations for the future of tech in society and within an ecology that we all share is one of the greatest opportunities that has yet to be fully grabbed. Ireland, in short, is indeed at the forefront of a conversation which is only nascent within Europe and only gradually coming up within global politics. And yet, the stuff that we discuss today are essentially the signals of the world that we're very actively walking into at an accelerated pace. We need to do everything possible to try and understand what the transition risks are, as I talked about them, what the derailment risks are, as I mentioned as well, so as to re-gear the world towards a redesigning of collective security. And Europe, for this, is equipped but it needs to completely reform the way in which it functions. Thank you very much for your attention.